This is the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. And now from the Hour of History studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello and welcome to Hour of History. It's Stephen and Matthias here and we're talking about uh, an interesting topic that's a word that's way overused in the news today and thrown out all over the place. But it's, it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, dictators and dictatorship. Which is something that uh, is one of those terms that it's extremely useful to look at in a historical context uh, rather than just sort of point fingers and say it, that guy's doing something I yeah like. yeah dictatorship it really it's like almost like fascism right it gets so used that no one knows what it means anymore it's just like that's bad that's a <laughs> that that political person is a dictator do anywhere. not use that word yeah 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 and we're sort of like well what do we what do we mean exactly where does the term come from what do we actually talk about when we talk about a dictatorship which is the perfect purpose of a sto- story about history so um, let's go back in order to figure out what dictator means. Uh, we don't usually go back this far when we talk about history. It's, it's pretty we? It's pretty far back, so we're going all the way back to Rome, not just the Roman Empire, but the Roman Republic is, is where the term or the idea of dictator and dictatorship first comes from. And so the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire really aren't taught so much in history anymore in fact the <laughs> i mean do, do the, we really teach history in american high schools anymore steve well no we do and this is actually a conflict I'm, I'm glad this came up this is a conflict because the new ap world history test is going to only be from 1450 on new york already did Boo. this with its global history regions um and it decided that it was going to make it only from 1500 on that was the magic year so that gets rid of a lot of history and here's an example of where a term and a concept comes from history that happens before 1450 yeah well not just that i mean if you even if you're interested in american history you got to know at least some about uh the history of the roman empire and the roman republic because all the founders i mean that's who they were reading they were reading these ancient greek and roman classics and they were basing a lot of their principles and the constitution out of ideas they were getting from the old roman republic so it's like you can't even make sense of american history without understanding the context of people being interested in ancient history and indeed a lot of the people that we're going to talk about today who sort of use that dictator label were people who like to appeal to the roman empire when they built their regimes yeah i mean um well there's there's some famous historian i think probably some french like a null school guy who was like everything past 1300 is just journalism <laughs> you know it's it's just for rookies the real deal is you know pre-1300 yeah you look at history departments around the u.s and you don't see people who study oh yeah professional historians who'd be like i'm a little shaky on things that happened over 200 years ago and you're like buddy uh, no what, do you, what do you mean <laughs> roman history is sorry we're inside in, baseball in we're the classics department no but it's important and it, it's, it would be interesting to see you know if listeners had taken a roman history yeah. course well Probably it's funny not. because um i mean just lay people like normal average joes joes and janes who are interested in history are actually really into ancient history. Like you find, I think, a lot more enthusiasm for ancient history among the normal, like just regular people than you do among actual academic historians. I think you're absolutely right. It's kind of interesting when HBO first started, it's like history docu-series dramas. They started with Rome. Yeah, because Rome's Rome's cool. Like I don't care what you say. Like Rome is, it's fascinating, right? And we just don't talk about it enough within the actual profession. No, not at all. And uh, so this is going to be a good introduction, at least to this concept. So Rome had the institutions that we borrow today, like the Senate and Exactly. Presumably, that's a democratic institution. So. Um, but we may have still retained the institution of the dictator. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. So a dictator is someone who was um, helping the Roman Empire, right? Um, well, the Roman Republic. So just very basically, so the idea of a dictator or the office of a dictatorship in the Roman Republic was in a state of emergency. State, Say that, for example, like the, the Republic is being invaded. If there's a moment of political crisis, something like that, something extreme where there's a potential for the whole state to collapse. A dictator is someone who was appointed 
in this time of emergency to take absolute power over the state in order to then sort of utilize the powers of the state most efficiently to save it, right? So there was sort of this recognition that when everything is in chaos, you need to just appoint a strong leader who can take control of the state in order to wield it and can make sure that it will continue to survive. Which sounds like pretty much every emergency sort of situation that comes to mind, you always have people saying, well, in this case, I need to do something extra special in order to help. Sort of like that, yeah. And I think, well, it's interesting too because the idea is that like the Republic is based on you know nominally representation, even though it was in, like, in Rome, like only like certain people and certain families and landowners and blah, 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 blah. But it was like a representative government of a kind. And so when you appoint a dictator, you're basically like temporarily destroying the Republic in order to save it in a way because you're basically saying the representation doesn't matter. Right. The whole point of why we have a republic, we're going to put that aside and basically appoint an absolute ruler for a limited period in order to deal with the crisis, which has like this kind of weird, implicit kind of suggestion that in moments of crises, the most efficient government is actually centralized rulership. I feel like the Romans would have learned that from reading Greek philosophers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, this, this, this sounds like Plato. Exactly, it's, yeah. it's, so, uh, so didn't Plato outline that, like, the best sort of leadership is, like, this enlightened dictator? Yeah, and the Republic, which yeah. is funny because, yeah, he, which dictatorships and republics don't get along. Uh, so, yeah, so Plato, a philosopher from ancient Greece, writes that, uh, that the, the most effective form of leadership is if you have one good person sort of in charge. And, and he does this, uh, you know, centuries before Rome comes to this problem, and the Romans are reading Greeks. Yeah, I mean, they're all, they're very interested in Greek culture. Like, the Romans are like cultural hyenas, right? Like, they just, like, go around the Mediterranean and Europe kind of like, we like this, we like this, we're going to take this, this, this. They kind of just blob it all into their own their own kind of I mean hy- <laughs> do they have to be hyena they could be collectors hunter gatherers uh, and- I don't know I mean they're, they're pretty I, I mean hunter like hunter gatherers is better because they're also killing other cultures and well, not taking things well sure I mean the Romans were pretty brutal they, uh, they, 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 they did not care they were like yeah we're going to take all your stuff and kill everybody that you that's fine. Yeah. And then we're going to take all your gods and rename them, and they'll be our gods now. So that's the gathering part. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the Roman Empire, uh, or the sorry, the Roman Republic comes upon tough times. They're being invaded from all over the place at the uh, sort of apex of the Republic, right? I guess so. I mean, we don't want to, if we want to get really into like details, but right, kind of the age of crisis of with the rise of Julius Caesar, right, where... You know, the Republic is weak. There's all kinds of problems, right? There's intense, you know, geopolitical issues, right? Caesar is this up and coming kind of military officer. Um, he gets sent to Gaul, the province of Gaul, by, by the people in power because they think he'll get killed there. Gaul roughly corresponds to what is today modern France. Caesar is actually incredibly successful in Gaul. Um, if you've never read it, you should um, you read um, Caesar's commentary on the Gaelic Wars. Um, that's some fascinating reading. It's pretty remarkable. We still have stuff that Caesar wrote that sort of survived because he just talks about like, I just went out on this battle and then I killed all these people and then there was a rebellion and then I just killed all these people. Right. And, 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 and there's a lot of like, uh, it's kind of interesting too because podcasts have really covered Rome extensively. Mm. Like Dan Carlin did the Rome. Oh, he like wrote a book and he's yeah. like famous just for like doing what we're doing, but for Rome. No, well, because <laughs> what's our, what's I our target there, audience, there's Steve? Really, no, there's the hunger for Rome. And so Caesar is a captivating character and I want to keep in mind that he is a military leader so uh, that seems to be a theme that maybe we'll keep in mind as we bring dictators to the present. Um, okay, so so Caesar has a power. He has control of the military already, and he has military loyalty. Those tend to be good things when setting up a dictatorship. Yeah, exactly. You need people on your side. Uh-huh. Um, and so long story short, right, all kinds of political crises. You know, he crosses the Rubicon in, in northern Italy, which is like – the marking of anyone coming across that river with a military force is is seen as like an invader of the republic. But he does declare himself at one point a dictator, right? He, he explicitly says, what I'm doing, I'm doing to save the republic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he sets himself up as a dictator claiming this. And then we'll never really know how it would have worked out because he got assassinated, you know. There's still like within Roman history this whole like – 
<laughs> duel going on between like pro Caesar people and anti Caesar people. You know, people like man, if Caesar had just lived, right, it, he would have he would have done it. You know, he would have preserved the republic. Right, he was he was just doing what he was trying to do. And other people like he was an evil, brutal, nasty man. Just a good old fashioned. <laughs> History debate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so Anti- after he gets assassinated and then, you know, I think like uh, not his son, but like one of his family members, um, you know, Augustus comes to power. But um, the office of dictatorship is ended after Caesar is killed. Right. Which I think is interesting. Right. It's, it's sort of saying that a dictatorship really kind of only exists in this weird kind of tension with a republic or with some sort of representative government because after the abolishment of the office of dictatorship the republic is also abolished and then the empire is established and then the people that are in charge are no longer like formally dictators they are explicitly like emperors right they're part of dynasties and i think that's interesting because like the formal definition of a dictator is someone who has absolute rule or absolute control over a state But oftentimes, that's just like what a king or a queen or an emperor has, right? Absolute control over a state. So I think it's about more, less about that the the dictator has absolute control than that the dictator exists in this tension or in kind of this like weird balanced state between it and and a sort of a state of representational government. Well, see, that's, yeah, that's interesting. And that, um, I've read that definition too. I think where I'm at with dictators is I I take a much more broad definition of dictator. I think a dictator, um, and we can get into this when we start talking about kings a little bit, is I, I think a dictator is someone who controls the state at totally. So, so it doesn't matter the tension between. I, I I'm gonna get rid of the nuance for uh, my definition. So you think that like every king and queen or emperor or empress that existed has been formally a dictator? I think if someone like King Henry the Eighth can say the Church of England is now the Church of England, you know, this <laughs> yeah. is not the Catholic Church. You're not talking to the Pope anymore. That that's a dictator. Someone who can take total control of the the social world and rewrite the rules. Is I guess it, so. Even I, with the, you know. See, I would push back because I think, at least within like Europe and other parts of the in, – in sort of the Western quote-unquote world, um, right? The idea of kings and queens and emperors is that they're like chosen by God, right? The divine right of kings and queens, you know? They're part of like a sacred bloodline that – has been given this power to represent sort of the, the majesty of, of, of the divine on earth or something. And sure, that also means they have absolute control, but I don't think a dictator is thought of in the same formal way. You don't see dictators talking about their divine right given to them by God. Dictators usually, especially right in the 20th century, um, talk about them expressing the will of the people Right, that I am in charge because I, you know, am the voice of the people, or I am in charge to save the state, or I am in charge to like save my people. You know, because I feel like kings and queens can often just say, I don't give a damn about my people, I don't give a damn about the peasants or whatever, like because I am answerable only to God, right? Like I, I am a king and I am above the people. Whereas I think a lot of times in dictatorship, dictators try to even though obviously they like do horrible things to their own people, they try to like justify what they're doing with that classical definition of I'm coming to power in a state of emergency in order to represent the will of the people and to save the people or the state. Well, I think that's probably a difference that emerges as the world becomes more secular, but um, I'm not sure that will hold up on the, (laughs) on the Asian dictators. We'll see. So let's go through it. So we have Kings, we have absolute monarchs, um, they go to an extent, like Matthias said, where they're saying they get this divine right to rule. So it's God that's endowing them to, so, so there's your divine dictator, but he's not in a moment of tension, always in power, but okay. So the monarchs of Europe get a divine right to rule. Certainly the monarchs of Asia have this heavenly mandate. This sort of thing works for both of those. Um, and they can make any laws that they want. They, but you're arguing that because they're not interested in the people or because they're not doing it in a moment that is to save the people, they're, it's not the same sort of dictator. Yeah, I, I guess it's more like when I think of dictators, a lot of times I think of like dictators and ideology, right? I think of dictate, right? I, I, I don't know if like there's kings and queens, but not every king and queen or ruler, right, has necessarily an ideology or like this conception of themselves as like representing something. You know, I feel like, and there's like a really kind of crappy definition I read a a few days ago about like the difference between say like a dictator or a tyrant and 
um, and like a king or queen is that like dictators are also often seen as exceptional, right? We don't think of that as a natural thing. We're like, that's really weird, right? But kings and queens somehow do have a more naturalized like st status, right? Like we look at kings and queens and we're like, you know, that could be good or bad, but we don't say like, wow, that's crazy, right? It's It's well, like sort of like... I don't know what, what, what about like the enlightened monarchs. So well, yeah, but that's a difference. So I feel like going into like the modern era, which we could define roughly as like what 1750 onward. Right. That's when you do start to see the more modern definition of dictatorship really take off, right? Okay. In right, because I feel like what I would say is like for a long time, it's just naturalized within people's ideas of the world that kings and queens are just how the world is. This isn't about states of exception and saving the state. It's just that kings and queens are how the world works and it's only starting with like new ideas getting pumped out through the enlightenment that people start to think well could you organize states differently do you have to have kings and queens and with that right we get the rise of the idea of like representational government and all the rest of it and the french revolution and the american revolution but you also start to see the rise in the idea of this return to kind of the more to the roman idea of dictatorship Right, well, which is again why I would think that they do exist in some sort of weird relationship. Like where there is an idea of representational government, there's like the antithesis of absolute control under like one exceptional person. So I'm gonna I, I, again, this is always like the classic like exception to every rule. In, in 1600, Japan is unified under a shogun Tokugawa, who is a total military dictator. He's in charge of the military. He's not an emperor. He's not given divine right, and he supersedes the power of the emperor to become a uh, total control of Japan. So. Uh, he, I mean, Shogun is by definition, right, a military dictator, someone who has absolute power, and this lasts from 1600 to 1800. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. It's always funny, like, even in talking environmental history or political history or anything, Japan always seems to... Uh, change the trajectory i mean they're doing things that the western world is not doing so i think that might be an interesting uh sort of like other dictator to consider japan has the shogun in power for for a long time and then they don't go back to the emperor until the meiji restoration and then then well then the emperor becomes uh, again <laughs> an enlightened monarch type thing yeah and then and then the monarch gets uh kabooted after world war ii yeah and again they get superseded by the military so i think we go back to that military being the important thing and uh with the monarchs the same sort of thing happens in europe so like if you think about the enlightened monarchs as being close to being a dictator and like l'etat c'est moi saying the state i am the state louis the 14th says you know everything i say is the rule in france but he gets toppled by the people and gets replaced by by another couple dictators. Um, but the difference, right, is because, like I said, because dictators operate on this model of representing the people. They're the voice, the idea of the people. Um, and, and, but I think military rule is also intertwined with ideas of dictatorship because we usually think of military people as efficient or as capable you know, right? There's like the kind of like in America, right? We do this all the time. We fetishize the military. We fetishize generals as, you know, this person's ultra competent. This person has some sort of skill because of their military service. And again, right? What are militaries for? They're for the defense of a state. You know, they're, you know, they, they are part of the state, you know? And so I think this is, again, goes back to that tension of representational government, this idea of the state, and then the dictator as sort of representing the state. Because we see almost like the dictator or figures that use the military to get control almost as like they have more legitimacy than someone who wouldn't be in the military, right? And I think also, right, in the military, what, what do we always think of when we think of the military? People swearing oaths of allegiance to the state, right, or in America, right? If you, when you join the armed forces, you swear an oath to the Constitution, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think this idea then is that it's easy perhaps, maybe I'm like, you know, psychoanalyzing a little bit, for maybe some military officer to think like, I have sworn an oath to protect the state, to protect this like constitution. And if it's in crisis, I have an obligation to take extreme measures to preserve it, oftentimes by coming into power <laughs> and centralizing it. Now, this is maybe, I don't want to make this sound like I'm making like an apology for dictatorship. Um, right. Oftentimes dictatorships are incredibly cynical and they just say these like these high sounding things to like, you know, to like make it sound palatable. But I think it, those those ideas are kind of embedded with dictatorship. It's like that's why you can have a, you know, 
just because you have absolute control doesn't necessarily mean you're a dictator. Well, and also like like well, kings and queens have absolute control. What you but sort of dictators. mentioned at the beginning was uh, dictatorship is a, is a loaded term now, but it hasn't always been that way. Dictator was not necessary. I mean, even going back to the shogun, like a lot of people died, but the shogun was able to unify Japan, something that hadn't been accomplished in for the better part of like five centuries. So, uh, which is generally good for people. Um, that they weren't warring warlords anymore. So, so we have this negative con- perception of dictatorship because we tend to focus on the atrocities that are committed by the military and these terrible things that are done. But in the end, uh, dictatorship does, or at least in the early modern period, brings stability to these places that had not seen stability. Uh, can we talk about Napoleon? So Yeah, and I guess Napoleon is kind of like the archetypical example of... I, I guess of like a modern type of of enlightened despot and a kind of like maybe best case scenario for a dictator who by the way calls himself the eagle referencing Rome yeah and yeah I mean so but it's funny because again this is also another thing with history are you pro-Napoleon anti-Napoleon um, <laughs> when it comes to the French Revolution but yeah I mean Napoleon is a kind of this this figure who follows this pattern right he's a military officer you know, he rises through the ranks, through the revolution. He's wholeheartedly behind the revolution, you know, really believes in these principles. He eventually comes to power and centralizes ruler under himself, and he, like, reestablishes himself as, like, an emperor, um, you know, dictator, absolute ruler. And then he goes around with the Grand Army, basically trying to conquer Europe and make it part of this, like, weird liberal empire. And most of, like, the major legal developments in Europe at, in the 19th century, like, so many of, like, our modern ideas of how states work and how the, the European state system works, and yeah. it comes from Napoleon. In fact, our state <laughs> right, like, of Louisiana still uses Napoleonic code. It's the only non-common law state in the United States. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Um, so if you get, if you, you know, become a lawyer in Louisiana, uh, you can only practice in Louisiana. Whoa, that's, wh- yeah, whoa, that's wild. Napoleonic law. Um, so yeah, he gives us all these reforms. And so, uh, but it reforms I, that most people now would say were a good thing. Well, uh, except for the whole fact that well, he, he, said gives, he killed a lot of people. <laughs> he gives the slaves their freedom and then, or no, he rolls it back. Mm. Slaves got their freedom in colonies in like Haiti. Haiti and then Napoleon rolls it back. So he's not this total good dictator yeah but i guess i guess with napoleon is that yeah i mean he's obviously did incredibly nasty things again not trying to make apologies for napoleon but to point out right that i think the appeal where we're talking about the appeal of dictators is because you can demonstrably look at examples of dictators and see their efficiency right if nothing else dictators can get things done and right did napoleon yeah Tokugawa. yeah they got things done they passed reforms they made legislation right they made sure things happened and i think that's also part of it is that representational government is messy right it's it's you don't always get what you want it's difficult there's lots of bickering all kinds of problems you know you have political parties that like cause infighting within you know civil society over who do you support why don't you support them whereas the idea of a dictator is hey we're all represented by this one figure and this person doesn't have to deal with anybody else. They can just get things done. Right. Which and is, that, that will lead later on to the rise of Mussolini and Hitler, right? Because that's part of Because when we talk about fascism, right? Mussolini claiming, I will make the trains run on time. You know, it's basically an argument of efficiency. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, the dangers... It's, it's interesting because happening at the same time are uh, places that are openly rejecting the opportunity for dictatorship, like... George Washington in the United States, who certainly had the same things that Napoleon and Tokugawa did. They're uniting these uh, distinctly different sort of factions. They have control of the military. They have popular followings, and they're operating in tar- times of turmoil. Uh, but Washington opts not to become a dictator and honors the sort of democracy. Was Washington a good uh, historian? And he knew it never. Does it ever work out for dictators? I. I don't think so. And that's like, I think that's like kind of like the, the dark appeal is that his, you look at it like a dictator and, or like in moments of crisis, dictators look good because they, they're efficient. They get things done. But very rarely does like a state or like a political like, you know, grouping survive a dictator, you know, or at least it, it doesn't survive in, in the same way. It's not like you have a dictator ideally because in, in the Roman Republic, the idea is state of emergency, dictator comes to power, 
does what the dictator needs to do and then steps down and then the republic continues but that like never happens right especially in the modern era right after a dictator comes to power the state is never the same even if that dictator perhaps voluntarily steps down which like also hardly ever happens right. and so i think it's this like it's this temptation dictatorship is like a dark temptation within the world of representational government because you want things to get done you have a political crisis and so it looks like the best solution would be let's just get a big strong ruler who can do absolute control and make things work but then right it never actually works out that way well so let's look at our early modern dictators so tokugawa and uh shogunate in japan ends up having 200 years of isolation relative isolation that seems to work out but the problem is as we've talked about with previous sort of regimes is you can't be isolated in a global world and the 19th century world is very much global so japan has to come to terms with foreigners eventually and that sort of ruins the dictatorship there napoleon has to fight off off other uh, regimes across Europe, and then his own kind of hubris gets bites him in the back. <laughs> much like uh, the yeah, G- yeah, much. Uh, it, there's a lot. There's some old geopolitical patterns that start to emerge when you look at European history. And and but so Napoleon also fails, and he lasts much, much, much fewer years than uh, the Japanese shogunate. He's only around for you know a quarter century. Uh, if generously speaking so so they, they don't tend to work we go for it a little bit and uh italy gets united and italy gets united giuseppe garibaldi pl- proclaims himself a dictator so all these different which is ironic because garibaldi is also fighting a kind of like emancipatory liberal revolution right i mean he's saying like we need to abolish the old kingdoms and kings and queens and establish like a new type of government like he's basically trying to do the french revolution american revolution in italy right and and so but he uh, becomes a dictator <laughs> right so we have i mean so and we still honor this guy i mean his statue stands in washington square park in new york city um and he's largely credited with uniting italy do, do you think maybe he's like the one case of successful dictatorship because he dies like or <laughs> oh, like, like doesn't yeah. i mean so so but italy i don't know if i would call italy successful <laughs> Because what happens with Italy within, a, I mean, it doesn't even last a century before it gets its next dictator. And and a lot of the strife of the sort of inner war and post-World War One period is, is fermented by the growth of fascists in Italy, right? Um, so, I don't know. It depends how long-term you're judging success. I mean, Italy's a united nation-state. It now. is still a nation-state, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so maybe yeah, but, he is a successful dictator. You could say the same about Japan, though. I mean, it's still an entire... Again, unified. one of these what is like what if Garibaldi hadn't died right. as, when he did or something? What if Tokugawa had never conquered Japan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, right, I think pointing out my exact point about this, like they exi- they're kind of like symbiotic dictatorship and representational government. I don't think it's an accident that someone like Garibaldi could fight most of his life for a revolutionary cause to abolish you know, kings and queens and to try and unite Italy into this, like, more liberal nation state and then end up becoming a dictator. But he doesn't abolish the king. In the end, Italy remains a a kingdom. Yeah, but but the king is so, like, so, like... I mean, they're just so emaciated, right? Like, it's like saying, like, oh, Great Britain is still as a king or queen. It's like, what? Like, you know, it's like they become symbolic. They don't have any real political power anymore. Yeah, but they have enormous social power. They have enormous... Like, cultural cachet, yeah. Cultural significance, yeah. Um... Okay, so that so anyway, so there are dictatorships. Garibaldi, we might say, is one of the more successful ones in the fact that he unifies Italy and it remains a unified state. Um, and then, where where else are there dictators? Um, I well, the, I know polemically in the United States, some people would say that Abraham Lincoln kind of was de facto dictatorial during the Civil War, just because he was using so many kind of wartime emergency powers to try and railroad things through Congress. Because you know it's it's a war, right? You gotta you know you gotta do things. You gotta make things happen. And so I, this is also something that more dark conservatives will like on the dark end of the political fringes will be like Abraham Lincoln was a dictator. But you do see even like people who study like you know congressional history and like constitutional law will be like, wow, Lincoln was doing some crazy stuff during the Civil War to make sure that he got done what he wanted to get done to try and win the war. And this is where like I kind of have a problem with the just broad application of the word dictator because so earlier I was arguing that we should be able to broadly apply dictator. But in that sense, um, then anyone who exercises 
an extreme level of control is sort of like a soft power dictator. So like Lincoln never, I mean, the United States president is, is in control of the army at the end of the day. Are they not? Commander, the commander in, chief. in chief. And so they have that military qualification of dictatorship. Lincoln certainly controlled Congress because, uh, you know, the South was not showing up. And, and like, you know, stuff like the recognition of Haiti happens under, you know, that would not happen in American history otherwise. So, uh, I mean, in, in my broad definition of dictator, as crazy as that sounds, anyone who's exercising these sort of overarching powers of political and And social, without any checks on them. And there's no real checks. And, but we see this throughout history in in all sorts of forms like like i think dictators much much uh maybe it is as broad as people tend to use it ah, I, don't, I don't know but so but then the classical types of dictators that people talk about all the time come in the 20th century right and so i think that's where we kind of get a problem with this word and that's where this word certainly gets it's it's association with things like genocide and violent conflict um but w we have dictators even before say world war ii yeah obviously i think it's that if occasionally you saw dictatorship being used maybe not positively but maybe neutrally right by saying it's a state of emergency this person is like a dictator Right, this per like literally this person is dictating. They're giving you know orders and commands. They have like a lot of control and power because of whatever political crisis. Maybe you reckon maybe you don't like that, but you sort of recognize that's something that happens in the world. Right, dictatorship after you know World War One, World War Two loses any kind of you know non negativeness it had before because of the horrors of of what happens under the you know, the absolute rule of two men in particular. Yeah, so Mussolini and Hitler um, are sort of like, if you looked up dictator... Archetypical. In, in, yeah, archetypical. There we go. A fancy word. Yeah, Jordan Peterson in, in studio. So, uh, <laughs> so okay, okay. I feel like Jordan Peterson would be down with a dictator. We can talk about that later, but I feel no, like... we'll get there. Yeah. I feel like they'd be like... Well, but first we have to get male to Hitler. energy we must... We have to get to Hitler, and we have to get to Mussolini. And, um... And Stalin, don't forget. And st don't forget my boy Joseph. Well, that's a different. I think I I'm gonna keep that separate. Or Mao. I keep the communist dictators separate because we we're also changing. Uh, the slight change is happening. It's it's not n any longer a person like Napoleon or Tokugawa Ieyasu. It is now a uh, party. Yeah, yeah. It's no longer like a military. Like the great dictators of the 20th century don't come to power through. I mean, there's definitely lots of military dictators in South America and in Africa, for example, but in Asia also. But you don't see the grand dictators that we think of when you think of dictators. They don't come to power in the 20th century through military. They come to power through political ideologies, right? Power political parties, and movements. A, and a lot of these political movements are sort of it's kind of like your efficiency argument. Uh, it's the arguments are being made that things aren't getting done. To benefit the nation, they're all pretty nation centric too. They're hyper nation centric. Hyper nation centric. So, like when Mussolini is is rising to power in Italy, we're talking about an Italy uh, that has has lost its confidence after World War One. I. I mean, there's been a brutal war for Italy. Uh, there's all kinds of you know stuff going down italy, yeah. italy is not go it, having it, good if times. we're thinking of a state of political emergency like post-world war one italy is definitely um a good example of that and so so i think a lot of those things start to appeal to people but how one, one thing i always wonder with these dictators that uh rise to power through these political apparatus is how how do the things like i mean mussolini and his his uh, cadres like just pouring gasoline down people's throats to kill them and like openly murdering people how does that escape in the dictator like are people really that after efficiency it's got to be more well than i think it's i don't know Mussolini is a really fascinating figure because he initially starts out as kind of a socialist right i mean he starts out as like a journalist kind of like a radical political journalist um you know he writes a lot about socialism he has what we would think of as like very left-wing economic ideas but then after the war, he moves very right-wing, but right-wing in a very weird way. And this is also like, 
we're getting into that weird territory of like what exactly is fascism it's like kind of a squishy concept you know like what's the definition of pornography no one knows. well you well you know like that supreme court was it a supreme court decision where like you know i don't know obscenity but I, I i can't define obscenity but i know it when i see it type thing i feel like sometimes with fascism is the same way like no one can define it but most people seem to be able to agree on it when they see it um and but yeah and so mussolini right comes to power he starts you know or more political prominence forms this political party you know does the march on rome and the black shirts but a lot of the rhetoric that mussolini starts buying into is that we need to get rid of the communists right this is the thing you start seeing all over with the rise of right-wing movements in europe after world war one is we need to prevent communists from coming to power that communism or what they often call bolshevism represents a fundamental threat to our nation and to our people and to our way of life and in response we need to take radical measures to fight them and destroy them aka like Mussolini like well let's pour gasoline down their throats type thing like we we have to come to power to preserve the state is often the argument that's used by fascist movements right-wing movements in Europe after World War One. and I think here you can see how the dictatorship uh, and that's the weakness of the dictatorship is is it has to have instability it has to have an enemy to justify itself it has to have instability and it has to have an enemy so what happens is these people feed off instability so they so they take targets and they take the political parties like um in spain in italy in germany it's it's often the socialists and the anarchists who are targeted and this creates an enemy of the people an enemy of the military and it's almost always a group that has some sort of military might yeah well i think that's too because if we talk about dictators as supposedly having um you know that they get their reason for being coming to power in like what's supposed to be a regular representational government they come to power in a state of emergency then the dictatorship, if it wants, or the dictator, you know, wants to stay in power, you know, if they're not just going to step down after supposedly solving the political crisis, then they always need to be creating more problems. More problems, right? They like, in a way, right? It feeds on itself, where the dictator and the dictatorship realizes that there always needs to be a continual state of emergency, whether that's actually happening or not. The people need to perceive that there's a state of crisis in order to justify the dictatorship to stay in power. Right. And this is sort of where... Uh, Which is where they're different from kings and queens again. What? Because kings and queens don't say like, like, oh, there's all these problems. That's why I need to be the ruler. You know, kings and queens just say like, I have the right of God, so deal with it. <laughs> well, not all kings and queens. I don't. I think you're I'm sure right, changing may, a lot okay, of kings and queens. Maybe. Like, Catherine the Great was certainly picking problems to go solve well, for well, the Russian Empire. Well, she also came to power through a coup d'etat and like uh-huh. probably poisoned her own husband, but that's, so, that's so, neither I mean, here nor there. No, I know, but I'm <laughs> What I'm saying is, so the, so the kings can be dictators, but not all kings and queens are. Dictators. Yeah, exactly. I would say that uh, because yeah. So okay, that's fair. I'll agree with that. But it's also interesting for these dictators uh, that have to have problems. The ones that we said, so like Garibaldi. I mean, his his whole issue is uniting Italy, yeah. and then he exits stage. So it's not like uh, it. It's not a continuing issue, and the pro- and so Mussolini, his thing is not just getting Italy on its feet. His thing is to make Italy great again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, make make, make Italy like the Roman Empire again, exactly. right? Like you know, we're gonna invade Ethiopia. We're gonna like build up the military. But more than that, right? It's also like we're gonna hunt down these degenerate, you know, pinko bastards or whatever. We're gonna root out communism because that's the fundamental threat. And I think it's interesting, right, that the you know the word fascism comes from the term fasces, which is um, the Latin word for that symbol of a rod, of like a rod with an axe head. Um, sorry, give me one second yeah. to look at the formal definition. Yeah, because you know what I'm talking about. I say fascist, like it's the bundle of rods with the axe in the middle of it, and it used that's to be on the United States dime. And it's it's still like in con- like in the Congress. Congress, yeah, and on both sides flanking like the speaker area. Yeah, it's which is pretty wild. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's weird. Well, but because, <laughs> I mean, the symbol well, yeah. of an axe and, well, and yeah. a bundle of wood. Yeah, it's, it's workers. Well, but not just workers. It's also a symbol of like authority. Right, so it was even popular during like Latin and Greek culture to show it as like the holder of the fascist is the holder of power, mm-hmm. and so the fascist movement comes to pa- like uses that as saying like that's what we're doing for Italy today. We are seizing control of authority in this time of political crisis to save you know the Italian people and the Italian state and to AKA make it- Italy great again. But the thing is, right, that symbol was like super popular. If we're talking about like the influence of ancient culture that people don't 
don't understand if they don't study ancient history. Like right. the fascist symbol, because you see it everywhere in like political buildings, even in the U.S. or like as, as a symbol in all kinds of paintings. And you're not going to know, like, where does this come from? How, what does this symbol represent within our own politics if you don't know And what's kind of extraordinary ancient history. is the, the another one of those symbols, and I don't want to get too far away from dictatorship, but it's important to notice that they're side by side, is the red Phrygian cap of the French Revolution. So the Phrygian cap going back to Greek history, but it, it's used in modern times as a symbol of the people and sort of like the people's revolution. Yeah. And so in the U.S. Senate, we have both the representation of power from, you know, the Roman Empire, the fascists, and the, uh, Phrygian, the Phrygian cap, cap which, which is which democracy. I, so. Which I feel like that's actually a good symbolical way to represent the tension of what I'm talking about, of representation versus, you know, absolute control, right? Who has the control of the fascists, you know, like the bundle of rods and the, and the axe, and then who wears the cap and i feel like a dictatorship is where those become fused right where i think this is like like you know mussolini says i am like the voice of the people like i'm il duce right i am the boss like i am you know like i am the people almost right like i yeah I, I, it gets a little squishy right but i think that's that's a good point about the those both of those symbols exist in the same political space and their intention right right and so those these sort of things uh continue to happen uh one of the things that uh, mussolini and hitler both make a key part of their dictatorship is that um it, no matter what level of government you're at everyone has to proclaim fealty to the dictator. So like you're responsible to your boss. So there's like a pyramid scheme, but the dictator is always at the top of the pyramid, no matter what. Yeah. Well, I think, and then, so let's kind of shift away from Mussolini for a bit and talk about Hitler, you know, kind of the, the elephant in the room whenever you talk about dictators. Um, Cause like, I think there's, there's important to distinguish between Mussolini and Hitler. Like they're both nasty people, but there are significant differences in how they actually like come to power and how they operate. So like Mussolini, is almost more of like literally a national socialist. Like what the Nazis say they are is like, we want to like create a more powerful state and use these like left wing kind of socialist principles, you know, in theory to like make a worker state, blah, 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 take care of the people. And we're going to do that by centralizing control through our party and through the leader of our party, you know, Mussolini, Il Duce. Um, but it, in Nazi Germany, right, it's not just that like the people becomes a kind of like nation state ideology. It's that the people are a racial ideology, the Volk. Right. So it's not. So that's where it gets really. That's why Hitler starts invading places, because it's like, you know, he says, I represent the Nazi party. The Nazi party represents the will of the German Volk. Right. Of like, you know, this racial group and ergo our like power is not just limited to Germany as a nation state, wherever there are German people, the party Nazi, you know, the National Socialist Workers Party of Germany and I, Hitler, as the leader of that party, we have we have sovereignty anywhere that there are German people. And they use that as their excuse to, you know, to basically, you know, invade Austria and unify it with with the, with their new Reich. They do that in Czechoslovakia, right? They take over big chunks of it initially because they're like, this is a German area. They're going to be part of our new Reich. That's why they invade Poland because they're claiming we need to get all the right. Germans and Poland but, but, back into Germany. So, so Hitler's, Hitler's dictatorship is a particularly, uh, and that's why Hitler's becomes most brutal in history is because it's so tied to this idea of, of racial. Yeah. And again, if we're talking, if we're talking about enemies. Yeah. I mean, there's no better way to make like you people hate each other than to double down on racial identity. Right. And so in, in his scheme of things, the, the Germans have to be at the top of this. And so it, there's always going to be a battle. Anyone who challenges the Germans is, is going to be an enemy. Yeah. There's no, there's no, like, that's why the idea of citizenship becomes like null and void within that kind of ideology right in a way that i think is different from a lot of other dictatorships because it's no longer about like are you a member are you you have citizenship in germany it's like are you what what's your race right and that is where it gets really nasty because citizenship even though it has its own problems right with nation states at least it's like has a kind of like system of law to it there's a kind of accountability to it whereas with racial you know ideologies there's no accountability it's like you're in or you're out right and, and so, well, and that's the, that ultimately spells the end of the German dictatorship because, because it's not sustainable and, well, and the atrocities they carry out are uh, ultimately fought, the world pushed back against Yeah, because everyone realizes that even if, I mean, even other right-wing movements across the world re recognize that like to a degree that what Hitler's trying to do is just like, and not just that it's like horrific and evil, but it's like, it just literally cannot 
it's not sustainable in any way without like wiping out everybody else on the planet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that at the core, that's like what that ideology comes down to is like, you know, we are the master race. And then Hitler says, I'm the master of the master race, you know? So right. it's like, you, you can't brook any, you know, challenges. You can't operate in a normal like system of international, like body of laws with that kind of ideology right whereas you look at another dictator who emerges at the same time in in 1939 francisco franco in spain he does not uh push that same yeah he comes to power through the military and he claims to be kind of a fascist i mean he's supported by by nazi germany during the spanish civil war but he sort of realizes how insignificant spain actually is at the point like when he meets with hitler he says he wants morocco and, and hitler's just like quiz Hitler's like why why would Germany help Spain get mur- like you're useless Spain you're not going to do anything for <laughs> well yeah because I think maybe Franco knew that like well crap if Hitler is successful in conquering the rest of Europe we're, we're, we're next. yeah we're next on the chopping block because there's no yeah there's no way that you can like kind of negotiate and make friendships with that kind of like racial demagoguery it's like either you're part of the master race or you're just on an ever kind of increasing list of people that will be killed. <laughs> and it's interesting to see that Franco is able to survive through World War II until the 1970s. Which is, yeah. And he takes part in the United Nations. He takes part in Western alliances like NATO. And he survives as a dictator and essentially a fascist. And, a phalangist. Yeah, yeah. And maybe he's another example of like, I wouldn't say that he's good, but he's, he's successful in terms of making sure his dictatorship lasts. And his state Spain his, lasts yeah, Spain, perhaps longer than yeah, it would have Spain been doesn't Republican. totally collapse after his death, right? It transitions. It's not functioning very well. No, it starts <laughs> collapsing now. Oh, yeah, yeah, it starts <laughs> collapsing now. But, like, you know, it's not as if... But he was successful in terms of, like, he didn't blow up the state under his watch or he something. He did kill a he whole did, bunch of well, people. Well, he... Yeah, I mean, okay, so he did, like, slaughter a lot of people. But the state and, survives. But this, yeah, but that's, like, the whole point of dictatorship is, like, in a weird way... It like fetishize like it, it this the people become less important than the state becomes important right and and when you do that you can just justify killing a lot of people because then if you say you're operating in the name of the state then you can start doing lots of in group out group of like do these people belong to the state do these people belong to right. the state and I think that's why going back to an earlier point oh you see a lot of these dictatorships arise in Europe after World War One because with the rise of communism. I mean, the whole point of communism is it's like global, it's international, right? It doesn't recognize, it, it, it's a global ideology. The wor- there is no like nation of the workers, there's no homeland of the workers, right? And so when you're fighting an ideology that is based on, you know, erasing borders, then these dictators naturally will double down on the national state identity. And then they can really easily start cauterizing or cutting out people that they don't like from that. But then we end up finding dictatorship in communist states. Yeah. In fact, in the Chinese uh, constitution, the communist constitution of China, it says right away, China is a one party dictatorship. The, the, The party is the dictator. So, so that like kind of re the dictatorship of the proletariat. Exactly. It redefines it redefines sort of what the world knew as dictatorship by saying like uh, by just sort of flipping it on its head. But at the same time, there's one person who's saying for the proletariat. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so there is one person who's and and it's it kind of works on communism's like ideology that that history is on a trajectory because they're always in this point of tension until they get to communism so the point of tension is there for them always because they're in the revolutionary struggle everything is a state of emergency until full-on global space communism (laughs) right Right, right. that's that's the ideology so so then you can justify anything exactly and so that's where we get these absolutely brutal dictatorships from the left this time yeah and i think that's where you know, Stalin is exceptional because Stalin also comes to power through a party, right? I mean, Stalin, and I think this is also fascinating to emphasize is like in the 20th century, you see the rise of dictators coming from like the bottom, right? Mussolini is basically a nobody initially, right? He's just some random like political journalist. Hitler is a nobody, right? I mean, he's like a nobody from Austria. He was like homeless in Vienna for a few years. You know, he's like a, he's like a war hero basically during World War One. I mean, he does get like very, you know, gets lots of medals, but like he's like a nobody, right? He's just some random political radical until the twenties. And then Stalin is also kind of like a nobody. I mean, he's just like a dis- he's like a seminary he's school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's like a seminary school dropout that gets involved in like radical politics and robs a few banks. Like, you know, these aren't people that you would think if you had looked at them in say nineteen ten, 
1915 even and been like you know who's going to be like ruling a vast majority or who's going to like be the biggest political players in the world you never would have thought it would be these three people and i think they do it through ideology and political parties and so i think that's just something to point out really quick that's always what really fascinates me about that period in in history is how these people coming from the bottom become like absolute dictators it's really quite remarkable you don't see that happen too often like so like stalin like his dad was a cobbler right and then he becomes maybe arguably one of the most powerful men who ever lived in history and but okay but even still and these are a little different than our previous dictators because they're not rising through the military no um, party party yeah. party party so so dictatorship or at least the path to dictatorship becomes goes through politics and and these also these dictatorships maintain the state and they maintain the state for a while. Uh, China's still there, you know. And but they cause massive amounts of suffering and death. That is that the world tends to now associate with dictators. Yeah. Well, I think particularly with with communism, and this is, or at least the way that communism was interpreted by the Bolsheviks under Lenin, is really, um, it's it's uh, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of like um, contradictions because. Yeah, the idea with communism ideally is we want to like get rid of nation states. We want to establish this like enlightened economy where the workers run things and they get a fair share from their labor, blah, 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 blah. And Lenin and, and Marx earlier had said, well, to do that, you need to have a revolution to overthrow capitalism and overthrow the bourgeoisie class warfare. And Lenin really defines that as you need a committed revolutionary party, right? Almost kind of like the tip of a spear point that's going to like – gather the workers because the workers aren't necessarily going to get radicalized on their own right you need to ramp up class warfare with this revolutionary party and those then that party will be enlightened and they will become kind of the leaders of the workers of the proletariat who will then go on to create the grander global revolution but that's already centralizing power within a small group of people within a political party and then the question is well then does that mean that who's in charge of the party is like in charge of the workers, you know, it gets really complicated. And so then after, you know, Lenin, right, I mean, the Soviet Union becomes very centralized very quickly. And then very quickly, right, Stalin rises through the ranks of, rank, sorry, through the ranks of the party. And basically under Stalinism, that's kind of the ideology is that Stalin is the people, right? Like Stalin represents the party, like Stalin represents the party and the party represents the people. And because this is a nation, like this is a workers state, supposedly on paper, then there's no contradiction, right? Because Stalin equals the workers, you right. know, like A equals B equals C. So C equals A, Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, yeah. And so it's, so Stalin doesn't have the divine right of Kings. He has like the divine right of history or something where like he can justify anything. And he's always seen as on the right side of history because he is representing this movement into the future of the establishment of communism, which means, yeah, he can basically have total dictatorial control and commit, you know, genocide and mass murder and all kinds of atrocities because he represents like the will of history or something. And so that, and that's certainly, there's, uh, it's not the same situation everywhere, but there's echoes of that in countries all over the world, Romania, uh, Albania, Chile, North Korea, China. So let's, Cuba. Uh, let's go Cuba. Absolutely. And we go post cold war. A couple of them survive like North Korea, Cuba, um, so what, what China, China survives as well. And, and China now is sort of going even more and becoming, you know, like this dictatorial police, our, our man, Xi Jinping. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so it still exists, I guess. So my homie, she, <laughs> I mean, we don't want to necessarily use the word successful, but those dictatorships have survived, uh, longer than many dictatorships do. Um, and in terms of China, like uh, a lot of people have died under <laughs> under the communist regime, but China's quality of living is at a point that it's never been. Its role in world yeah. governance. Again, well. again, talking about that temptation of dictatorship is that sometimes dictators like they get things done. Like and like Mao killed like tens of millions of Chinese, but also. I mean, the birth rate improved, literacy improved, and same with Cuba. And, yeah, and and you know, industry improved. It went from like a backwards like agricultural empire to like a great world power. But I guess this is where it becomes uh, disconcerting: is people, um, I think, see those kind of things and like get impressed by it, and people never factor themselves into the part of people that gets 
uh, exterminated or destroyed, people always say, well, I'm going to be, you know, in the dictator's good graces, and then we'll just get a lot of stuff done, and everything's going to be The trains great. will run on time. It'll right. be great. <laughs> Everyone wants the trains to run on time, but no one wants to be the person, you know, ch in China, the construction workers who are laboring on those trains, and we can talk about forced labor at a later they, like, episode. like, die and get, like, paved over. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's no big deal. So there's an enormous price to pay, and I don't think people factor that in when they look at dictatorship, because people... I, I have heard people talk favorably about dictatorship, especially in regard to states in the Middle East and Asia as saying stuff gets done so fast. Yeah. Well, I think, again, yeah. I mean, if you look at, like, the chaos in the Middle East, um, which is largely created by America, <laughs> which is FYI, or right in, in Latin America, right, there's a whole slew of military dictators or there were – a lot, right in times of political turmoil, yeah, I mean, dictators look appealing because, like we've been saying over and over, they get things done. But then you just – there's never, like, a good moment to figure out, well, when when has the dictator done enough mm -hmm. to, like, make the state stable again? You know, like in China, it's sort of like, well, we're just going to keep building socialism until we have it. Right. It's like, but when is that ever going to happen? <laughs> you know, like, like so, so inevitably, right? I mean, sure, Xi Jinping's going to be in charge until he dies, right? Well, isn't this the importance of the constitution? So in China, <laughs> yeah. Xi Jinping changed the constitution. To make himself ruler for life or president for life. Exactly. Yeah. So, and that's... Because Mao is, is enshrined as like the eternal blessed ruler forever, right? Or is that... that no, no, that's no, in North Mao's Korea. Sorry. Downplayed. Yeah, Kim Il-sung is in North Korea. Yeah. Um, as is Lee Guan Yu in Singapore. Um, you know, so like, like these things exist all over the place, but the constitution, I think, is the sort of document that prevents dictatorships from going so far. Yeah, I mean, that's like the whole ideology behind, you know, kind of the the constitution or like the, like the beautiful ideal of the constitution is like, you know, checks and balances, you know, it's not always going to be perfect, but this will ensure that no one can ever have absolute power for too long, blah, 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 blah. Um, we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's looking a little shaky these days under Trump. Um, uh, well, but but constitution legal documents are really the only defense against dictators it's telling yeah. someone you can't do this because it's our law is the only thing that in in the cases that we've gone over that's succeeded whenever the law is changed or they say that law is no longer legal that's when the or i power. mean like a situation in poland right now where the ruling party i think the law and justice party basically kind of totally changed the constitution they kind of railroaded it through their 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 you know representational system and basically forced a lot of oppositional judges because their supreme court's diff way different than right. you know there's like dozens of them and blah 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 they basically like forced all of these judges to retire and then cut down the size of the supreme court i think and then tried to appoint a bunch of their own like crony judges and I think this is another point about again because you're saying the rule of law is something we always talk about is like that's the one thing governments and people have to prevent the rise of right. is that you have this like this document or this piece of paper or these principles that if you go against them you know you go against the law and you will get arrested you will be punished so increasingly I'm thinking especially if we're seeing the rise of like new authoritarian quasi dictatorial states in Europe and in other states across the world people have wised up and realized the way you get around that is you just change the law you, well you change well, well yeah not just that but it's like in soccer right if you're like an opposing team and you want to beat the other team like maybe the best way to do it is not to play better but you just like get the goalie like you get the the referee on your side like you you We're make looking at you england yeah you get the ref on your side and i think that's what's happened also in the united states um is that you get your people in charge of making the laws and then you or you make sure that your people interpret the laws in such a way that benefit you like it's sort of like institutional capture in a way and i think that's what's happening in a lot of places where you go look at constitutions or you look at countries on paper they're representational and democratic but de facto they're not because all of the systems of power have been taken over by a political party, you know, or by, you know, people behind this certain ideology backing one figure. I'm also kind of looking at the United States if we look at like the Republicans in the last few decades, right? I mean, a lot of it has been institutional capture or, you know, changing of the laws like Newt Gingrich in the 90s in the Congress or the Supreme Court, right? We all kind of recognize now that 
the Supreme Court is no longer about the literal rule of law. It's just about can you get judges on there that well, interpret the law I mean, the, the way you want Supreme them to. Supreme Court's been like that since Andrew Jackson. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I think it's maybe just become more obvious now. Where like we recognize it's like oh like it doesn't ma- like we all talk about like oh we need liberal judges or conservative judges, and I feel like that's implicitly already kind of like sad because it's like we recognize it's not about the law it's just about how you interpret it and how this is and like republicans focusing on alec you know like like all these like movements and and think tanks and groups that are based on getting conservative judges into positions of power to make sure then that their ideas of how the law and the constitution should work benefit them (laughs) right which is is a continuation of this sort of uh political rise to power that we've seen uh Putin. <laughs> Basically for the last two centuries. It's no longer the military taking over like it once was. So like the early modern period, it was more military rise to dictatorship. Even in the back in Roman times, it was through the military power. But that's, um, and that's not how it is. Now it's political more so. Yeah, and I think, um, I think it's a weird – for something that really kind of makes me unsettled is like this weird – almost kind of, I don't know how to frame it other than like business dictatorship or like, like yeah. dictatorship with like a, a business capitalist flavoring. And I guess what I mean by that is um, like a lot of people, you hear this, people say, well, why don't you run the country like a business, mm-hmm. you know, which again is I think harking back to the old arguments for dictatorship is this idea like, why can't we just make the trains run on time? Because we always, because of the fetish, because the idea implicit when people say run it like a business is make it efficient. Mm-hmm. You know, make it like profitable, make it work. But the problem is, if you look at the way businesses work nowadays, it's less, especially huge, like giant international businesses and whatnot, it's less about then producing good products and actually being efficient, but it's about producing profit for shareholders. Yeah. And, and, so, but, and, so <laughs> and also how CA, CEOs work in businesses. They have like dictators. dictators. So when you're saying run America like a business or run the country like a business, it's like, so you mean we need to install like a CEO with like absolute control? <laughs> and then this goes back to the people who are sort of advocating for this, seeing themselves as part of the group, as part of the in-group. But in reality, in business and in dictatorships, most people are part of the out-group because yeah. you need the You got to destroy the competition. You have to destroy the competition. So if there's one thing we've learned from dictatorships, it's, it's that – uh, perspective goes a long way and I think perspective is something that we're sort of missing missing these days like everyone is imagining themselves as part of this celestial dictatorship that is going to include them and make their life better but the real question and the real fear and the real suffering happens when the dictatorship doesn't actually do that yeah and I think as well like it's part of this kind of like dictatorship flavored business or business flavored dictatorship or capitalist flavored dictatorship is also if you look at Silicon Valley and a lot of like the weird fetishism among like the Silicon Valley elite for China and for like the way China's operating, because a lot of it is based on wow, America is really inefficient. But look at China; it's they're done they're, so yeah, fast. Yeah, they build like a road in two days, and then you're like, well, how many people got killed doing that or died or like you know what are the social costs? And like, oh, don't worry about it. Xi Jinping's doing great, you know. And it's like this weird like thing of like, why don't we just have an authoritarian kind of quasi capitalist system like China has? And you see like you see like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon, like all these people are into that. Or like Peter Thiel and all these like crazy like libertarian folks. And so I feel like Silicon Valley for all of it's like the way that certain liberals in, in the United States kind of fetishize it is like technology's good and we can use all these technologies, blah, blah, blah. But in a way, all of the people who run those businesses are increasingly moving rightward, right? They're increasingly saying, run America like a business, a.k.a get a new dictator and that's like how trump is saying i'm going to run america like one of my companies well, number one trump has like bankrupted a ton of companies he's not good but number two like as i said that that's a that is a dictatorial argument right that's like almost like a you're you're saying get a ceo in power who's going to you know destroy the competition but also who are going to if you think of america as a company what's its product you know, and and not just what's its product, but like who's it supposed to benefit then? Because if we're saying like in big business internationally, it's shareholders are who companies are accountable to. Well, then who are the shareholders in America? It's not American citizens. It's political donors to political parties, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. That's the thing that really scares me a lot these days is they're going to maybe – and I feel like too maybe even on the side of the left that 
as America becomes ever more kind of politicized and inefficient and our kind of representational government breaks down, you're going to see more and more calls from all sides of the political aisle for we need somebody or something to come to power that can make things right. work to yeah. get, make the train run on time. <laughs> and, and the thing is about these two is they last and they last and they always, one of the big features is they're always putting forth this message or this image that we're on the path. We're almost there. We're almost going to do it. Just like businesses always bluff their numbers and things like that. And then it all goes down so fast. So mm. people, I mean, pay attention to what's happened in the past and maybe we can avoid... Um, Hopefully. I mean, I feel like Silicon Valley's in for a kind of uh, economic reckoning very soon. If you look at startup culture, it's all based on smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So hopefully uh we don't have uh, a depressing topic but uh keep keep in mind pay attention when people talk about like efficiency and pay attention when people are talking about running america like a business because there it's, it's a little that's that's uh, that's some eerie language it's an old dictator trope uh so yeah that's dictators for you hopefully Ooh. you learn something new feel free to drop us a comment or any question thanks for listening to hour of history where it's our world anytime any place. Bye.